This is the Evening News for Tuesday, September 23, 2014. I'm Michael Young. Thanks for joining us. Making the headlines tonight. 16 escape unhurt after aircraft accident near Kaichur Falls. Trotman muzzles accuser with $50 million lawsuit injunction. APNU rejects president's offer to meet, starts countrywide pickets. Police recover firearms in Pataro Creek. Gaisuko rejects Gawu's proposals to settle Skeldon strikes and Balwan Singh launches first IVF service. It's now time for the news in detail. Let's tell you first that a crew member and 15 passengers escaped unharmed after the aircraft they were traveling in landed a short distance off the runway, causing minimal damages to the tri-lander. The incident occurred on Sunday around 16.05 hours at the Kaicho Park Runway Region 8. According to information reaching this newscast, the aircraft is a BN-2AMK2 tri-lander owned by the Golden Arrow Airways. The aircraft was wrinkled in the area of the wing. Speaking with the Evening News, Director of Aviation Safety Regulations, Ankar Dubey, disclosed that a team headed by Paula McAdam was dispatched to the location on Monday to conduct investigations. However, he noted that the aircraft has since been ferried to Georgetown and is at the Ogle International Airport for examination. The lone crew member on the aircraft was Captain Larry Barclay, who has been sent on leave to facilitate investigations. With the revelations of damning sexual allegations against him, Alliance for Change executive member Raphael Trotman late Monday filed an injunction against his accuser. Details in this report. AFC member and Speaker of the National Assembly, Raphael Trotman, secured an injunction against 22-year-old Johnny Anthony Welchman, who has accused him of allegedly sexually abusing him several years ago. In the court documents filed on Monday, Trotman is seeking a whopping $50 million for libel contained in an article published in the Starbuck News and the Ghana Times on the same day and on Welchman's Facebook page beginning on Friday last. The Speaker also obtained an injunction restraining the young man from further publishing any other materials related to the sexual allegations levied against the speaker. Additionally, Trotman also asked for the 22-year-old to remove all contents on his Facebook page referring to Trotman. Welchman has alleged that he was sexually abused by Trotman at the age of 12. However, he noted that he was being abused since the age of 8 by a close relative. For the Evening News, Michael Young reporting. The main opposition party, a partnership for national unity, has again rejected an offer made by President Donald Ramatar to hold a dialogue on local government elections and to meet to discuss other important issues. We hear why in this report. Newly appointed General Secretary of the Partnership for National Unity, Joseph Harmon, says leader of the opposition, David Granger, will not meet with President Donald Ramatar unless it is to set a date for local government polls. Ramatar had extended another invitation to meet with the opposition leader to discuss recent developments in the sphere of local government elections. And we want to make this very clear that the only time he's going to meet with Ramatar now is if he's going to name a date for local government elections. Says no more talks and talks and talks and talks and talks. That's we right. are going to meet. The leader said he's going to meet with him if he's calling for a date for elections. Other than that, we're not having any more meetings. Granger had written the president issuing a September 15 deadline for him to set a date for local government polls. Granger has since said that he has begun to mobilize local and international action in support of local democracy. He said too that he will be approaching international organizations, including the OAS and UNISAR, to call on President Ramatar to set a date for local government elections, which was last held in Guyana in 1994. Meanwhile, a partnership for national unity on Tuesday commenced countrywide picketing action as the main opposition party reaffirmed calls for local government elections. Details in this story. Several communities in Guyana have been subjected to picketing actions by the Partnership for National Unity. The action by the party comes exactly a week after an ultimatum was given to Head of State President Donald Ramatar for him to set a date for local government elections, 
Officials within the APNU explained that the picketing action took place in regions that have a strong APNU support base. These regions include Barbies, Linden, Georgetown and Bartica. APNU leader David Granger promised protesters that more actions will follow until a date is set for local government polls. So we have to keep the pressure up to this morning. I'd like to say thanks to everybody who came out. And I'd like to say thanks to the organizers, the planners. And I'd like to ask you to look forward to another engagement because we will continue to protest until we get local government elections. 17 years too long. And our municipalities are in a mess, our tongues are in a mess because the PPP is trying to strangle local democracy. The APNU is protesting even though President Donald Dramatar had extended an invitation to meet. The party has been heavily criticized for its decision to protest and create more tensions in the country at a time when the AFC is also preparing to debate a no-confidence motion tabled against the government. But the People's Progressive Party Civics General Secretary Clement Rohe said that his party is prepared for any eventuality, pointing out that the opposition needs to make a decision on which elections they really prefer. More details in this report. With the no-confidence motion pending in the National Assembly, Rohi said his party is prepared for any eventuality, be it general or local government election. The no-confidence motion, if passed, will see the Donald Ramatar administration leaving office with general election following in 90 days. But with the long cries for the holding of local government elections, Rohi said his party has always been prepared. The question is not so much whether we are ready. The question is whether GCOM is ready because it seems to us the GCOM appears to be more ready for general and regional than local government elections. There's much more work to be done in respect to local government elections at the GCOM level. Citing the recent disclosure of Jamaica's Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller, Rohi said the PPP is at the same road with the same level of confidence. Miller had told supporters at the country's national arena that her governing People's National Party will win next year's local government elections as well as the 2016 general election. Rohi said that if a mass poll is taken, there is no doubt that every activist and leader would indicate their readiness for any poll. As the General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, I say yes. There's no doubt in my mind that the party machinery as well as the activists, leadership, and the party in all its manifestations are indeed ready. We have always been ready. He said while the PPP has always maintained that it is not an electioneering party, the party has been doing its groundwork. PPP's General Secretary Clement Rohi has said that both the Partnership for National Unity and the Alliance for Change seem divided on the no-confidence motion. Rohi said it is quite obvious that one party is heading east while the other is heading west. He was speaking at the PPP's weekly press conference held at Freedom House earlier today. He said he's waiting to see how they both will end up. The division is quite clear, according to Rohi, who noted recent assertions made by the AFC leader Kemra Dranjatan that the PPP administration was seeking to buy out opposition parliamentarians ahead of the upcoming no-confidence motion debate in Parliament. Whether it was uh, AFC MPs, he said no, it was APNU MPs. But he didn't name them. Now, I would have thought that since he and Mr. Granger are such clothed bodies, he would have called Mr. Granger, walked across the breakdown, or had Field Street, sorry, and told Mr. Granger, look, I have this information on three of your MPs. This rule, he said, indicates clear division. He said it is interesting to see, too, what is unfolding behind and between the two parties. So I'm wondering how close is this alliance really? These two parties seem to me to be on a collision course. <laughs> In a historic move, the Alliance for Change last month submitted a no-confidence motion against the ruling People's Progressive Party civic government, which, if passed, will pave the way for early elections. The motion has also received the full support of the EPNU. For the Evening News, Michael Young reporting. 
If you have a new step or new story you would like our news team to follow, message or WhatsApp us and telephone number 6809630-603-117 or 617-2867. You can also call us at our office on 231-0382 or 226-2102 or 223-723021. In this report, we hear that the Ghana Sugar Corporation has rejected proposals made by the Ghana Agriculture and General Workers Union to settle the matter involving a worker and senior manager at the Skeldon Estate, which has sparked a strike action. Following the dismissal of a mill dock operator on Saturday, factory and field workers at the Skeldon Estate engaged immediately in strike action, calling for the reinstatement of the worker, Stephen Daniels. Daniels was dismissed after he reportedly verbally and physically abused a senior manager at the estate on Friday evening. However, workers at the factory claimed that the manager was intoxicated and had provoked the mill dock operator. On Monday, officials of both Gaisuko and Gao met on the matter. Speaking with the Evening News, Gao's president Kumal Chand noted that he had gone to the company with two proposals. However, they were rejected by Gaisuko's director of industrial relations, Jairam Pitam. So we, we said that clearly there is a breach of industrial relations practice. Where he being so aggrieved in the matter, unilaterally make decision and claim that he wasn't um, the aggressor and he wasn't abusive to the man. So, unfortunately, Gaisuko, after they have consulted their CEO, refused either way of res resolving the matter. I, I, either both proposals were rejected. One, to withdraw the letter, or two, to let us have an, an impartial inquiry into the matter. According to the GAU president, this is a clear breach of industrial relations practices where the decision was unilaterally made by an aggrieved party in the matter. Meanwhile, Guy Suku in a press release on Monday refuted allegations that the estate manager was drunk. Instead, the company stated that the worker was aggressive towards the manager. The release said, and I quote, The type of behavior that was displayed by Daniels is recognized by the corporation as one that constitutes gross misconduct and such behavior is treated with summary dismissal. As a consequence, Daniels was summarily dismissed last Saturday, end quote. Additionally, Gaisuku has stated that some 34 hectares of unripe canes were burnt and is believed to be the work of arsonists as a result of strike actions. Chand pointed out that his union will not condone such acts to destroy the assets of the estate and property. We believe that the estate assets and property ought to be protected. Um, any destruction along those lines will hurt every stakeholder. And by extension, the people of Guyana. And we, 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 we wish to denounce it and call upon those who are, might be the perpetrators to understand that such action is inimical even to the resolution of this matter. On the other hand, strike action continues at the Skeldon Estate and has reportedly extended to the Albion Estate. Both Gao and Gaisuko were summoned by the Ministry of Labour late this afternoon for a meeting. This is the Evening News. More news still ahead. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with the evening years. During a patrol exercise, ranks attached to the F Division recovered two firearms 
along with a quantity of ammunition in the Patara region. According to a release by the Ghana Police Force, ranks made the discovery in two separate searches on Monday last. In the first instance, around 15 hours, the police were on patrol in the Wuzasi Creek, Patara River, when they stopped and searched a man who was acting in a suspicious manner. During the search, the ranks discovered a .38 revolver and 13 rounds of matching ammunition in his pants pocket. The man was taken into custody, arrested, and placed in custody to further assist with police investigations. Meanwhile, the other matter saw ranks on a mobile patrol in the same area later that day at about 17.30 hours, conducting another search on an all-terrain vehicle. A .38 revolver, along with six rounds of .38 ammunition, were found on the canopy of the ATV. The police were unable to make any arrests in this matter. Speaking with the Evening News, Commander of the F Division, Senior Superintendent Courtney Ramsey, disclosed that the investigations are continuing and the suspect in custody is expected to be transported from Madia to Georgetown today. He will then be charged and placed before the courts. The plans by the AFC leader Kemraj Ranjitan to help government retrieve the U.S. $4.5 million from the Syringa Engineering Company Limited is nothing more than a publicity stunt. Let's find out why in this report. At the party's weekly press conference on Tuesday, Rohi said Ramjitan is setting himself up as a broker between the governments of India and Guyana. The Indian government, through the Exim Bank, has provided some U.S. $18 million to the government of Guyana to build the first ever specialty hospital here. Recently, government has withdrawn the contract from the Syringa Contracting Company, noting that since late June 2014, it had been engaging SECL on a number of issues regarding allegations of fraud and financial irregularities. The FC leader had said last week that the party had sought out sources within India that could assist government in retrieving the outstanding sum. The government of Ghana, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has extremely good relations with the Indian High Commission here in Guyana. So for Mr. Ramjitan to seek to insert himself as an interlocutor between the Indian government and the government of Guyana on a matter that is of a bilateral nature, I think it is being rather intrusive and presumptuous on his part. Rohi said Ramjitan should remain where he is and keep to his legal profession. He said he couldn't understand why Ramjitan had to take it upon himself to go to the Indian officials for support on the matter. While reiterating that the party was never against the specialty hospital in Guyana, FC's leader Cambridge Ramjitan last week said that the party is in a position to help government if it so desires recover the U.S. $4.5 billion still owed to it by the Syringa Company. For the Evening News, Michael Young reporting. A quintuple was today placed in a $160,000 bail after being charged for attempting to commit a felony. 37-year-old Rolex Johnson, 35-year-old Leroy Lloyd, 37-year-old Kurt Kendall, 47-year-old Colin Goodridge, and 35-year-old Chetram Supnandan appeared at the George Young Magistrates Court before Magistrate Anne McLennan. It was alleged that on September 22 at Church Street, Georgetown, they attempted to commit a felony, that is simple larceny, from motor vehicle GMM 575, which is owned by Navindra Latchman. All five of the men pleaded not guilty. There were no bail objections by police prosecutor Gordon Mansfield. With that, the quintuple was granted $160,000 bail and is expected to perform community service at the Brigdown Police Station every Friday at 16 hours. The men are scheduled to return to court on October 28. The Alliance for Change has taken sides with Glenn Lal and the Kaito News and is now calling for the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority to be relieved of his duties. Let's find out why in this report. 
This call by the AFC comes weeks after a word got out that Kaichu News owner Glenn Lal was allegedly involved in several cases of tax fraud. These cases are under investigations by the GRA and have seen vehicles driven by Lal and his wife seized by the tax body. According to the AFC, Sitar was working in collusion with Legal Affairs Minister Anil Nandalal against the Kaichu News. However, Sitar in a subsequent interview addressed those claims. He said that he remains committed to carrying out his duties and is not faced by the AFC's attack on him as a public official. Sitar pointed out that the real issue that should be of concern is the blatant violation of privacy by the Kaitra News. The newspaper on Monday published an email correspondence between Nanalal and Sitar. Political observers have said that Lal is now running scared of prosecution and is looking to use every dirty tactic through his newspaper in his favor. A 24-year-old resident of Lot 108 Covent Garden, East Bank, Demerara, was today remanded for a simple larceny charge. Anthony Peters appeared at the Georgetown Magistrates Court before Magistrate Anne McLennan. He allegedly stole one X-Trail motorcycle valued at $380,000 belonging to Edward James on September 20 at North Road, Georgetown. The unrepresented defendant pleaded not guilty to the charge. According to police prosecutor Gordon Mansfield, the cycle was recovered at Rudy Hut. He then objected to bail on the ground of the offense's prevalence. Peters was remanded and will return to court on October 28. If you have a news tip or a news story you would like our news team to follow, message or WhatsApp us on telephone numbers 680-9630 or 603-117 or 617-2867. You can also call us at our office on 231-032-226-2102-223-723021. Join us after these messages when the news continues. Welcome back, I'm Michael Young with the news. In a surprising move, Shadow Public Works Minister Joseph Harmon was appointed General Secretary of a Partnership for National Unity. Details in this report. One of the a Partnership for National Unity's sharpest critics of the ruling People's Progressive Party Civic, Joseph Harmon, has been appointed as the coalition's General Secretary. This was confirmed by the a Partnership for National Unity, which said that Harmon was appointed last Saturday. Harmon, who serves as Shadow Public Works Minister, has been severely critical of several projects undertaken by the PPPC government over the years. These include the Amila Falls Hydro Power Project, the Specialty Hospital, and the Marriott Hotel. Most recently, he has been critical of the forestry sector and is set to square off with the Guyana Forestry Commissioner, James Singh, in a debate later this month. Harman served as APNU's campaign director in 2011 and is a long-standing member of the People's National Congress Reform. He was also an advisor to former president Desmond Hoyt. For the first time in the history of Guyana, couples who are unable to conceive are being given a second chance through a scientific method referred to as the in vitro fertilization program offered at the Balwin Sink Hospital. Details from Alexis Rodney. Gynecologist Dr. Maru Singh announced today that the first in vitro fertilization program was conceived in Guyana and delivered just a few days ago. Both baby and mother have been discharged and are doing well. At a press conference to announce the accomplishment, Dr. Singh said before now, patients requiring this kind of service will have had to travel to neighboring countries, including Barbados and Trinidad. Some of them went as far as the United States and Canada. And you can imagine it entails multiple visits because they have to be evaluated first, the partner has to be evaluated, they have to undergo multiple tests. And then the, the duration of the treatment, they have to go and stay in Barbados or Trinidad, so the traveling expenses, hotel expenses, etc., all that got added on. The in vitro fertilization is treatment needed by couples that have tried simpler methods and had failed to conceive. It is the only option for patients with low sperm counts, blocked fallopian tubes or prolonged unexplained infertility. This is the only option when patients have to use donor sperm or donor eggs. 
as well as those women who have severe uterine problems or have had their uterus removed for some reason and wish to have a baby. This does happen. These women can use a surrogate to carry their baby once they have access to in vitro fertilization. According to Dr. Madhu, the service has been in the making for some five years now and has cost the medical institution close to U.S. $500,000. Madhu, who disclosed her intimate passion for gynecology, particularly as it relates to fertility, said that service is a highly complex procedure and requires a dedicated lab and theater. The cost to the patient per cycle of treatment is approximately U.S. $8,000, and this is due to the high cost of medications. Since the beginning of the service in January of this year, some 56 patients have been processed. For the Evening News, Alexis Rodney. Thanks, Alexis. Guyana will be holding the second biannual visual arts competition this year in November, and all sculptures, potters, painters and visual artists in the whole are invited to display their pieces. The GVAC is being hosted for the second time this year, having been revived in November 2012. The competition is not a new creation in the arts community as it has been in existence since the 1960s. However, due to some difficulties, it had collapsed. Elim Hussein, chairman of the Castellani House, the nation's premier art gallery indicated that the Culture, Youth and Sport Ministry revived the GVAC in 2012 as there was a need for an art exhibition for Guyanese visual artists and an opportunity to also showcase and enable the work of young artists in Guyana. Tourism Minister Irfan Ali today met with bus operators from routes 31 and 44 over consumers' concerns about bus fares. Details in this story. As passengers continue to highlight their concerns over the exorbitant bus fares, Industry and Commerce Minister Irfan Ali said that discussions are ongoing to arrive at an amicable solution. The minister was at the time speaking at a special meeting with the Minibus Association earlier today. And as a result, we have decided to continue our discussions route by route <coughs> until we're in a position to bring normalcy to the situation, one, and two, to regularize what exists. So this afternoon, we're very pleased to have on board representative from Route 44 and the 31 route who should be here shortly to discuss issues surrounding uh, their zones. The minister indicated that there will be other meetings and other matters pertaining to zoning and the roadways. He noted, however, that these issues fall under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of Public Works. As of recent, consumers, including passengers, have been complaining about the exorbitant prices they're made to pay after hours when they seek to use public transportation to reach their destination and to get home after a long day at work. Work. For the evening news, Michael Young reporting. You're tuned to the evening news. More news still ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching the Evening News. It's now time for a look at what's happening in the region and the wider world. The Trinidad and Tobago government has confirmed that it intends to sell the financially troubled Colonial Life Insurance Company, Clico, whose collapse in 2009 sent ripples throughout the Caribbean. Finance Minister Larry Hue, speaking at the meeting of the Standing Finance Committee of the House of Representatives in Trinidad, said that the Coalition People's Partnership, which, like the previous Patrick Manning administration, had pumped billions into the embattled company, would only agree to the sale once the price is right. 
Huawei told the historic inaugural meeting of the committee that government would be paying out TNT $258 million before year end to several Eastern Caribbean countries for managing the costs involved in the CLECO fallout. The standing committee is discussing the TNT $9.4 billion budget that was approved by the parliament there earlier this month. Now, internationally, world leaders, including U.S. President Barack Obama, are holding a summit on climate change at the United Nations. The aim at the New York meeting is to galvanize member states to sign up to a comprehensive new global climate agreement at talks in Paris next year. It is the first high-level gathering since the Copenhagen summit in 2009. With so many nations attending the summit at the UN headquarters and so little time at the one-day meeting, three separate sessions will run simultaneously in three different rooms. It's now time for a look at your bridge reports. The Damara Harbour Bridge is expected to be closed from 5 hours 30 on Wednesday, September 24 for a period of one and a half hours. The Burbis River Bridge is expected to be closed at 17 hours 05 on Wednesday, September 24 for a period of one and a half hours. Join us on the other side of the break for your sport news. Challenges. Keeping your business running shouldn't be one of them. That's why we work every day towards ensuring your overall satisfaction. With over 100 skilled technicians and engineers equipped with the tools and skills to help you do more. With the largest parts inventory in Guyana, over 10,000 line items readily available. Driven by your success, is not just a set of words to us. It is a code by which we live. That is why we are proud to say that we are proud. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with the evening news. It's now time for a look at what's happening in the world of sport. But first, your headlines. Systems in place for Alnis horse race meet. Alonzo Greaves birthday cycling set for Sunday. And Hurricanes topple Northern District in CLT 20. The news is brought to you with the kind compliments of Makor. Every day presents a few more challenges. Keeping your business running shouldn't be one of them. That's why we work every day towards ensuring your overall satisfaction. With over 100 skilled technicians and engineers equipped with the tools and skills to help you do more. With the largest parts inventory in Guyana, over 10,000 line items readily available. Driven by your success is not just a set of words to us. It is a code by which we live. That is why we are proud to say that we are proud. Welcome back. It's now time for the news in detail. With entry stopping 70, the principals of the Alness Turf Club have already put most systems in place for the club's horse race meet scheduled for this Sunday at the club's location at Alness Village, quarantine Burbies. Rajiv Bisnot reports. Chief organizer of the one-day event, Marshall Crawford Jr., told his sportscast on Tuesday that an impressive lineup of animals have already been entered for the day's event, inclusive of Guyana's only A-class animal scores even. The animal from the Deroops Racing Stable was denied entry in last year's Guyana Cup as well as this year's Guyana Cup Fever and last month's Guyana Cup. 
However, when the animal returns to competitive racing on Sunday in the feature A class on lower 1600 meters event, she will do battle with California Strike, Set for Flame, a Church House, a Dark and Lovely, Run Non a Run, Bridal a Stone Corner, and Young Elite for a top prize of two million dollars. Organizers have added an event for unclassified animals, making the day's event an eight race program with all the big names set to be on show. All events planned for the day are the F and lower, G three and lower, I and lower, J one and lower, J three and lower, and there is a race for K class horses. Registration for the meet is open until Friday. Race time is 12.30 hours and admission to the venue is $1,000. Thanks for the update, Rajiv. National cyclist Alonzo Greaves will celebrate his birthday doing what he loves, cycling. The talented young rider will stage his inaugural birth anniversary cycling event on Sunday as we hear from Avinash Ramzan. The event, which will pedal off at 14 hours at the inner circuit of the National Park, will see rivalry in four categories. There will be races for youngsters competing in the BMX 6-9, 9-12 9-12 and 12-14 age groups with the winners of each category receiving $5,000 each. The main race, which is expected to be hotly contested, will go for 30 laps with each lap having a prime prize of $2,000. Apart from this, the winner will pocket $10,000, runner-up $8,000 and third place $6,000. Greaves, who has been phenomenal on the local scene and has represented Ghan at various regional and international competitions, said riders stand to benefit tremendously come Sunday. If you win more than one lap is, is a lot of money. If you mm -hmm. win all third lap is 6,000 in your pocket. Right. So uh -huh. it's, a, it's like that's your cash, is every lap. You have to sprint for $2,000. So 28 um, in front of the, um, the, the monument, monument uh, in the National Park. I think it's a children monument. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right there, it's starting at 2 p.m. The Rima Bikers Club rider said this would certainly not be a one off activity as he is contemplating making the event an annual one on the local cycling roster. Um, this is my body giving back to the cyclists. Mm -hmm. This is between my family and my wife and my close friends. Mm -hmm. Could you see this becoming an, an annual event? Well, I want to be an annual event, mm -hmm. so every year I'm going to do it. You know, mm -hmm. this is my birthday, so. Uh -huh. I give uh, thankful for every year God spare my life, so I have to be thankful for it, so I can give back. So the thing why I love best is uh -huh. cycling. Graves is urging cycling fans to come out and witness the race and be part of the excitement as the riders hunt for cash on each lap. Riders of the senior race are required to pay a fee of $1,000 to enter. Thanks, Avinash. Hurricanes topple Northern Districts by 86 runs to keep their chances of progressing in the Champions League alive. Hurricanes recovered from a slow start to post 178 for three before their bowlers combined well to dismiss Northern Districts to 92 all out in the 17th over. The Champions League will continue tomorrow with Calcutta Knight Riders playing Perth Scorchers at 10 hours 30. Meanwhile, for those of you who missed the spectacular catch by Brendan McCollum, during yesterday's game between Chennai Super Kings and the Dolphins, let's take a look at the brilliant effort on the boundary. Yeah, how well has he got that, Robbie Freiling? Just well enough. Just well enough. Brendan McCullum does brilliantly to knock it back, but he couldn't catch it. He's never going to be able to knock it back, but he couldn't catch it. He's never going to be able to catch it. Grabs it with one hand, and before he hits the ground, he lobs it back in. Unbelievable. Grabs it with one hand, and before he hits the ground, he lobs it back in. Unbelievable. And that has brought us to the end of the evening news for today, Tuesday, September 23, 2014. Please remember to get a copy of tomorrow's edition of the Ghana Times for details of these stories and others. I'm Michael Young. Thank you very much for joining us. Do have a good night.